Okay, I'm Barbara Mead. I'm one of the founders, along with Carla Cohen, of Politics and Prose. Uh, and I don't have a physical therapist, but I have an exercise therapist. And about three weeks ago, my exercise therapist gave me a copy of Run, Don't Walk. And she didn't give it to me, she lent it to me. Uh, and said, please read this. I think you'll find it very, very interesting. And which I did immediately. And uh, then I ran, not walked, uh, to Politics and Prose to sign up to introduce the author when she came. And so today is the day that she is here. Um, Adele Levine received her master's degree and doctorate in physical therapy from the University of Maryland School of Medicine and then worked in Walter Reed rehabilita rehabilitating soldiers who have lost limbs in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Walter Reed is not only America's largest military hospital, but it also has the world's leading military hospital. In tr it, it also is the world's leading hospital in treating uh, amputees. Um, I thought that Adele had just the right mix of compassion and humor uh, uh, about the long, hard days that she spent with the veterans in her care. She shared her vulnerability, which allowed her tremendous empathy with those that she was asking so much of. Her greatest survival tool, she'll tell you, is her sense of humor, which is why I found her painful story also a delight to read. Uh, Adele has written some 30 pieces of humor for the Washington Post, and when she's not working, she's uh, also a long-distance swimmer, swimmer, having swum across the Chesapeake Bay six times. Uh, but today, she's going to be talking. So here's Adele to talk about her book, Run, Don't Walk. Okay. Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. And I am uh, grateful to Politics and Prose for having me here today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit just about how it happened that I wrote a book. And because uh, I'm sure many of my friends are sort of still in disbelief that this <laughs> happened. <laughs> and also why I decided to write this book. Um, so in 2007, I owned a 17-year-old car that my friends nicknamed the Rustang <laughs> because the doors had rusted shut and the only way you could get in or out of my car was to actually climb in through the window. Um, but I loved that car and uh, in spite of the fact that I had to use a screwdriver to uh, unlock my seatbelt, um, I was never going to stop driving my car except that one day I was driving home and I was going down Georgia Avenue and I was about a half mile from my from my apartment and my, ha my car just all of a sudden just caught on fire. <laughs> and uh, you know, I didn't know what to do, um, so I just quickly rolled my window down and I unlocked my seatbelt and then I just kept driving my car. <laughs> and uh, I managed to get it home and I like whipped it into the parking lot behind my building and I jumped out of the car and then after that day my car just never drove again. And um, I felt terrible about it. And I just didn't have the heart to call a tow truck and had them come and drive my poor car away. So I just kept it out back where it just sort of <coughs> rusted away. And then one day I was at home and I was reading the Washington Post and they had this article about local eyesores. <laughs> yeah. And uh, at the end of the article there was a query, do you know of an eyesore? You know, if you do, let us know and we'll send a reporter out to write about it. And I thought, well, yeah, you know, I know an eyesore, and <laughs> it's parked out back. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to bother the Washington Post reporters with my tragic car story. So I just thought, I'll, I'll write it up myself. So I wrote it up, and then I sent it into the Post. And uh, then I went out with some friends. And when I got home that night, there was a message on my machine from the editor. And uh, he said that he loved my story. And he said, uh, if I had anything else I ever wanted to send in, just to go ahead and send it in. And then he added at the end, uh, especially if it was about Metro. I mean, <laughs> so 
I guess he figured, you know, here is a person who's definitely taking the bus. <laughs> so, um, so for the next three years, whenever something funny would happen to me, I would write it up and I would send it to the Washington Post. And uh, I was really lucky. Um, I was lucky for a couple reasons. One is I was lucky because it, I, it got my feet wet. Um, believe me, this book never would have happened. I never would have written this book if my car hadn't caught on fire <laughs> on Georgia Avenue. So, uh, and, uh, but mostly I was lucky because um, during those three years, it really gave me an outlet. Because at that time, things at Walter Reed started to get really hot. Um, I worked as a physical therapist in the amputee section. And at first, we mostly saw single leg amputees and uh, patients who had lost their legs below the knees. Um, but as the wars went on, the injuries steadily got worse and worse. Um, we went from seeing single leg amputees to mostly patients who were double and triple amputees, meaning they had lost two, uh, two legs and an arm. Um, and um, we watched the amputations move up the body. So they went from being below the knees and below the elbow to above the knees at the thighs, above the elbow. Um, we saw patients who started to lose their legs at the groin. And we even began to see patients with partial pelvic amputations. Um, by the time Walter Reed closed in 2011, almost all of our new patients were either double or triple amputees. And we had rehabilitated three men who had lost all four of their limbs. Um, but I was lucky because I had a hobby after work that forced me to sort of look for the funny side of life. And uh, all of my coworkers uh, who made it through those years at Walter Reed had some sort of outlet, um, whether it was baking cakes or training for 100-mile running races or even attain keeping up with the highly complicated world of celebrity news. Um, and uh, all of us shared a very dark sense of humor. Uh, you could go to the biggest trauma center in the country, and you might see one amputee. Uh, at Walter Reed, we regularly rehabilitated 100 to 150 amputees a day. And we did it all inside a glassed-in rehab clinic, which was uh, glassed in so they could lead tour groups around the perimeter. Um, and they led tour groups all day long, so you're always looking out the glass at people looking in at you. And um, my coworkers and our patients used to say, oh, you know, this is how it must feel like to be an animal at the zoo. You know, don't feed the animals. Um, but, you know, I always felt like, it, to me, it felt like just a really kind of dark sitcom um, because, you know, the tour groups always looked horrified, but then on the other side of the glass, on our side of the glass, we were always joking and laughing, and the patients especially, uh, they would make fun of each other. They would call each other names like Ugly Stump or Princess if someone was having a hard day. Um, and they wore t-shirts that said things like, I had a blast in Afghanistan and Marine 40% off. Um, and you know, the staff, we weren't much better. We were always consumed with whatever junk we'd seen on late night TV, including ordering a Snuggie for the clinic. Um, but the overall feel in there was that this was normal, this was life, and we were all going to move through it together. Um, this is the longest war our country has ever been in. And as my coworker Attain uh, puts it, uh, this is our generation's war. Uh, but it affects so few people. Um, <coughs> and on a personal level, I remember how completely astounded I was the day I got a patient who had lost both of his legs after doing six deployments. Um, uh, when Walter Reed began to shut down in 2010, it coincided with the surge in Afghanistan. And that year, the caseload at Walter Reed tripled. Um, unfortunately, Walter Reed was also in the process of moving to Bethesda. Uh, and the first thing that happened was that they started to shut down the employee parking lots. Um, so in order to find parking, you had to get to work no later than 6 in the morning, um, which we all did. We got to work at 6. Uh, we worked through lunch, and we stayed late. 
And uh, we were so busy that at night in my dreams, uh, everyone was an amputee. 